Hey there YouTube, welcome back to the shop. Dr. Yash here. So, we're going to continue the series on the forced air heater or torpedo heater basics. Um, I'm going to continue the series with this Dynaglow Workhorse 65,000 BTU heavy duty heat. Heavy duty heat. I don't know what light duty heat is, but this is heavy duty, so you better watch out. It's about to get hot. Problem is, customer complaint is it doesn't get hot because this one has the common problem that a lot of them do have most of the ones I've run into uh, that I've worked on tend to have this problem where it'll start up it'll blow a puff it'll turn back off so we're gonna dive into what can cause this problem and what is causing it on this one and the reason I'm using this one instead of my trusty old Sears models because this is a newer model that has rubber hoses that has a more modern control system on it so it would be a little bit better example to show you for in case you were looking at yours typically you're going to be looking at the newer ones uh, to give you a rundown of course like I said before 65,000 BTU so it's on the smaller end of the scale this one it has a thermostat control on it which you know goes low temp to high temp you can turn it completely off and just run it wide open this one also has a pressure gauge a different one than what I'm used to seeing actually I haven't even haven't even seen how this one works yet because uh, when I take this cover off it will be self-explanatory why I haven't seen that gauge work um, so I'll start by taking this cover off because we are going to actually I'm not taking this off I'm gonna take the top off Alright, so you probably remember from the previous video, this should look pretty familiar, pretty similar. This is, best I can tell, a 2004 model. Looks like February 10th of 2004 is the date code on this motor, so that should give you an idea. You're talking roughly 30 years difference between my Sears model and this one. This one does still have spark ignition on it. It does not have the hot start igniter. So I'll show you that now to explain what the difference is. So there still is spark ignition here. It's not your the old school spark plug style igniter. This one does have this big ceramic block with two electrodes. So And one thing you will notice, this model does have rubber hoses everywhere. And you can probably already tell right off the bat that most of the issues with this unit are probably going to be related to the hoses. All these busted, cracked hoses. These are sucking air. Well, these are leaking air, so it would be sucking air on the tank side, and air will be blowing out of these on the pump side. So, they're not on there very tight because they're cracked and they're busted. This one's got a big split here. So, we will be removing them. You can see this is what they look like. Just regular straight rubber hoses. I tend to use this Tigon neoprene based stuff, quarter inch, same size, you know, it's, it's nice and snug over the barb fittings. Very flexible, it's clear so you can generally see if you've got liquid flowing on this side, you know, it's helpful to visualize things. But um, cheap stuff, works good. Um, I am going to have to take the side cover off. Alright, so now you'll notice that this is the fuel hose. Interesting thing to note, the fuel hose is not the one that's all busted, but we are going to change 
We are going to change all of them. The air hoses are the ones that's busted, but for the sake of being thorough and to not have a comeback, we're going to uh, we're going to replace all of it. So here you can see the fuel filter assembly on this model. It does have kerosene in it, not diesel. You can smell it. This one has a strainer, pretty clean. I don't see any reason to uh, replace that. It doesn't even need to be cleaned. So we'll put that back in. So in the case of this one, I have already pre-diagnosed it, which is why I'm jumping right in. But basically, we've got the air hoses going to, from this fitting, coming out of the air pump to this gauge. We've got the air hoses going from the fitting over to the nozzle to be replaced. And then we also are going to replace the fuel hose, like previously stated. So now this can be a little tricky. You may end up having to, which I may have to take off the other side cover to come back up through the frame. But you can see it's pretty straightforward to replace the hoses on these. Like I said, a lot of the ones I see come in the shop that need work done, that have ignition problems, that have starting and stopping problems, most of the time it's due to their hoses. You can see the spark igniter transformer is right here if it ever needed to be replaced. Actually, this is a 2002 model. I found a more complete date stamp. It says 2002-10-05. So, this must be year 2002, 10th month, 4th day, October 4th of 2002. Doesn't appear that they have uh, secured this very well. It looks like it's always been there according to where the dust is. But it's just sitting in there. And that's very uh, I'll just use the word interesting. But all I'm doing here is pulling the air hose through the frame. There's a hole in the body that the fan is sitting on, and then there's also a large hole that's underneath in the red sheet metal that you can't see from your angle. It's it's up underneath. So that I'm passing through two layers of, of sheet metal here, and I'm going to come back up through this grommet that the ignition secondary wires go through. So we're just going to bring that up and around, and what I'm going to do, so you can see where the photo cell and a temperature protection device are. There's a, a temperature switch and a photo cell, and we're basically just going to um, we're going to work around those. It looks like the fuel hose passes around those. The air hose just comes straight up. So we're going to go right in here. So what I did is I went to the local store that sells this kind of hose. I usually only use it for these heaters. So I, I don't keep a stock of this. 
But I went over there, picked up about five feet of it. Actually, it was four feet of it. And you can see we've pretty much done the whole machine as far as air hoses goes. So it doesn't take a lot of material to get these going again. I don't like the way this is set up, but I don't see any other way to secure it because I'd be drilling through the fuel tank to uh, secure it with screws. So it looks like this foam was pushing up against the back of this panel and that's what was holding this in place. So well, it's kind of cheesy, but it got the job done, so I shouldn't uh, shouldn't pick on it too bad, I guess. Been around since 2002 and still doing its job. These are little hooks to wrap your extension cord on because they only give you a stub length of three prong cord over here to work with. Right, we'll go back to the other side. All right, you'll notice it's a little bit different size. So. I do have some other fuel hose that I'm going to bring out and we'll be using them on that one. Usually all the hoses are, are the larger size, but I think this being a smaller unit, it's got the smaller hose in it. Not a big deal. I've got some other stuff we can use, so I'll be right back. We're back. Jump back in here. Might have been a couple minutes for me, but it was probably one frame for you. So I got some other fuel hose. It is a section of the straight rubber kind, which is not the easiest stuff to find these days. I don't know why it is, but it seems lo like locally where I'm at, straight rubber hose is not that easy to come by. So, but you can tell we got new piece, nice snug fit. It's going to get the job done very well. Unfortunately, it's not the clear stuff, so I kind of like the clear stuff. It's a little bit more flexible. But in this case, we have a little bit smaller fuel fitting, fuel fittings. So sometimes when you have loose fitting, uh, low pressure hoses like these, you, you end up having to do something like clamps or in the case of something as low pressure as this, you can get away with um, even using zip ties on the barbs and it holds it on pretty well and seals up well. But in this case, we got good fitting hoses. We don't need that, but we have new hoses installed so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break out the air gauge it's part of what I do especially when dealing with air system problems on these newer ones you can see it has a ther thermo sensor or a ther not thermo sensor photo sensor photo cell um, and this board here actually one different one notable difference on these this board here is actually the controller and it does have an integrated circuit here, an IC, and it is a logic chip that is looking at the output from this photo cell. So that's one of the big differences on these newer ones versus the older ones. And when I say older, I mean old, like antique, like, like my Sears model. Um, the Sears model has a circuit breaker that only allows a certain amount of current to pass for a few seconds before it shuts off. It's very mechanical in its safety system. This is very electronic, very programmed. So what I'm doing here is I'm threading this air pressure gauge into the test port on the back of the pump. You'll see this screw here. I'll show you what we got going on here. We have the port and the flathead screw is your adjustment. I did also put an air filter in this machine. This one was missing its air filter, but the plug for the port was here. I just took that out with a wrench. You know, hand threaded a zero to 15 pound gauge. Something with a large face, it's easy to read because these are pretty precise on how much pressure they want to see. I believe this gauge on this one is also looking at 
I believe it's actually looking at pump pressure uh, and relaying it to the control circuit as well. So on this one, and on most of them, you'll find that the pump pressure is written right on the side on the spec on the spec uh, little spec sheet in this table here. Pump pressure PSI 3.5. So we're going to set this to three and a half. We're going to see how it runs. We're going to see what the gauge on the side says. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how well it runs with the hood off. They generally run better with the hood on, but it's kind of neat to watch. You won't get to see as good as I will the burn that's inside there because it's very difficult to, to film down in these little openings in the burner. But I'm going to uh, get this plugged in and come back when it's time to fire it up. Okay, so I got an extension cord ran to it. We're just going to turn it on and see what it does. You ready? you seen what I seen but it might have pushed one and a half pounds of pressure that's not very good it's very low and you can also see right off the bat I shouldn't be able to put my fingers on this uh, adjustment screw that easily you also probably noticed there was no combustion you know how loud these are they sound like little jet engines we had no combustion you heard the spark igniter kick in before it even spun the fan up. So I'm going to turn this in a few screw a few turns and we're going to try it again. Let it reset. There's a little light over here that was blinking to indicate an error condition. This one doesn't have a little some of them have a display that actually tells you what the error condition is this one doesn't have that it just blinks so I'm gonna try it again after I turned it up ignition see we got that up a little too high we're actually blowing flames out the end Uh, running a little better. We still have flames coming out of the end. We still have flames coming out of the end on it. But I'm going to put the hood back on and we're going to go from there. I did actually line it up so that it was, uh, you see on here it shows low and high pressure and there's a little red line in the middle. I lined it up so it was about at the red. You wouldn't think it was a little bit more pressure it needed to do that, but it just makes it look nice. Part of the reason I believe it was making the noise it was making is because the airflow is affected by the hood not being on it. So now we have the hood on it. I'm going to go ahead and put some of the screws in because the fan can hit on some of these if it's. The fan I've seen them hit before, so. 
I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just going to put the back four in there just to get it, just to secure it. I do believe it's actually uh, pretty much out of fuel, so it might shut right back off on us. All right, like I said, it's out of it was out of fuel. It did shut right back off on us, so I cut that part out. It's all edited in post, so you didn't get to see the failure, but it did happen. So um, it looks like this gauge on the side actually prefers for the unit to be around 4 PSI. I did add some more fuel to it, so we'll get to play around with it some more. It does prefer it to be around 4. Honestly, that's more for um, peace of mind for the customer. The thing runs fine at 4 PSI, uh, and 4 PSI satisfies the red line on this gauge. So I'm going to probably stick around that pressure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and fire it up after fueling it up. I'm going to tweak it a little bit and I'm going to show you. I'll see if I can reposition this. No, that's not going to happen. I'm going to show you the end cone. Basically, you don't want to have it turned up so high that flames are actually coming around the, the end of it, which is what was happening before. A good clean burn is going to have all your burning occurring within your combustion chamber, which is the big metal cylinder you see inside there. Um, yeah, the end cone's gonna glow a little red, but you really shouldn't have like flames shooting out around it. This, isn't, this is a heater, not a flamethrower. I mean, if you wanted a howitzer, you should have bought one. That's not what this is for. So, um, really what you want is enough pressure to burn clean, to burn good and hot, and, um, three and a half PSI on this one is a good starting point. You want to get it pretty close. It's going to be within the ballpark. That's actually a diagnostic aid as well because if you set it at three and a half and it runs like garbage, then you have a problem and you need to address it. You might have a clogged nozzle. You might have a, uh, they say the nozzles wear out on them. You may, uh, you may need to replace your nozzle. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's had some abrasive uh, fuel run through it. So, you know, the fuel can have a little bit of grit in it because uh, it's not a super fine strainer uh, maybe your nozzle's actually worn out you know if it's got too much fuel at three and a half or versus not enough fuel at three and a half so you have to you're gonna have to judge that and use a little bit of uh, deductive reasoning there and a little bit of critical thinking skills to figure that one out um, at that point but three and a half is going to get you in the ballpark so you know Maybe you have to crank it up an extra half a PSI to satisfy this gauge or to make it run a little cleaner. Eh, that's fine. Go for the least amount of fumes and the best burn you can get, and I'll say you'll probably be happy. And the control board in here is going to be pretty happy with it, too. So I'm going to go ahead and hit it again. Let's see how it does. Got this spark ignition. You can see the thermostat works. I just turned it off. It's not smoking when it shuts off, so it's burning pretty clean. Um, 
I dialed it back to about three and a half. It's just above, it's just on the low side of the red line on this gauge on the side. So I think I'm gonna roll with that. You can see it was a nice clean burn. The nose cone was getting a little red, but it wasn't sitting there just, you know, about to melt down. There wasn't any flames coming out around it. It smells very clean. So I think this has been successful. Looks like, uh, you know, changing the hoses, setting up the pump pressure and you know, basically just uh, going through and doing a tune-up on it um, has got him got this this customer ready to go so I think he's gonna be pretty happy with it so anyways um, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this one hopefully that gives you a better idea of what's going on when you've got issues with your air and fuel systems and what to look for and what to look at so anyways let me know in the comments if this video was helpful for you. I mean, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe. And uh, also, stay tuned, because if you've seen out on the left-hand side of the screen, there's another big orange torpedo heater. It's got some big problems, so I'm sure I'll be videoing that as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, it's got a problem I don't know that I've seen before, so that'll be a fun one. So keep your eyes peeled, but until next time, I'll see you later.